enter when ready. Hi, welcome back to another episode of Captain's Log. As you know, I have been in fan films, Star Trek fan films, a lot. And I have to say that my, probably my favorite or top of the list anyway, getting up there, is uh, starring in the series called The Lexington Adventures. And um, I just wanted to be able to show you all three of the episodes uh, this week. The first one is Rise of the Tribbles, wherein uh, Admiral Eric Menard uh, is reviewing the tapes and some of the comments on the so-called Tribble infestation, especially uh, some, we get to see some uh, notes and uh, comments from the Klingons, from Chief Medical Officer uh, of the Lexington. And it's a lot of fun. You don't quite realize what's going on until they start talking about furry things and whatnot. And it's actually, once you get through it, you realize it was kind of a tongue in cheek uh, thing that poked at the, the Tribbles. And without further ado, here is episode one of the Lexington Adventures, Rise of the Tribbles. Computer, begin program. For nearly a century, tensions with the Klingon Empire have run high. The enemy we faced was unlike anything the Empire had seen before. There was no sense of honor. Nothing we could understand. Our greatest warriors strived to keep them at bay, but to no avail. Starfleet intelligence knew that the situation the Klingons found themselves in would not last long. We had to ally ourselves with whoever was bringing the Klingons to their knees. None of our informants in the Empire would dare mention a name for risk of dishonoring their house. Once we learned that the Federation would use this enemy against us, we made sure that they would find it difficult to contact the filth that had stirred our bloodlust. Little by little, we gathered intel that we hoped would reveal who it was the Klingons were so afraid of. Afraid? Klingons? Ha! We are warriors, born to battle. We feared nothing. As hard as we tried, all we could find was the name and location of the homeworld, Iota Jamorium IV, in the heart of the Klingon Empire. This is the ally the Federation would use to turn a century of hostilities towards their favor. We could not allow them to gain the advantage so easily. All we knew was that it was a planet the Klingons used for trade. We explored several ways of getting our contacts there to gain the trust of our would-be allies. Our foe was numerous and relentless. It seemed that not even Kalas himself who'd once stood before 500 warriors with none but his Parmakai Lukara at his side and again single-handedly fought off an entire army at the three-turn bridge could prevail in this task. Starfleet Intelligence had a ship that could avoid detection from the Klingons an Odysseus-class starship but it was still too far off from being completed. We needed something there now. As most of our warships were otherwise engaged in purge of this small furry nemesis, we made sure to keep a vigilant watch over the Federation, augmenting our border patrols with merchant vessels, civilian cruisers, and transport carriers. Even though we knew the Klingons were watching us, we had no choice. We had to make our move before the Klingons made theirs. One false step could mean another war with the Empire, but if there was one ship that could stop this war and complete its mission, it was the Valiant. We shouldn't let the Federation make contact with those Gnite pests. Rather than allow the Empire to fall into chaos 
because of an infestation of Yichme, my fleet was dispatched to eradicate them from their home world. We called it the planet of the damned. When we arrived at the planet, Triple Prime as it's called now, we realized that we had made a grave mistake. Starfleet has a way of appearing when one least expects it. The Klingons had waited for us to make a move before they enacted their plan. We had the vermin and the Federations in our grasp. We barely escaped with our lives. There was no going back to save them. Those Patakpu came to our doorstep to rescue an ecological menace. We had to destroy it before the Klingon Empire itself was overrun. It is fitting that Starfleet was there to witness the annihilation. It was a massacre, but we were fortunate. Not all the Tribbles were killed. We beamed one up before the Klingons were able to get to it. It was glorious. Honor was restored to all Klingons on that day. For some reason, the Tribble we saved died. It must have known that its kind had been wiped out and lost the will to go on. Warriors were dispatched throughout the galaxy to hunt down and kill every last remaining Tribble scum. And we were victorious. In a sick twist of fate, the Tribble's extinction was a turning point between the Federation and the Empire. It brought both sides to the table to not only talk about their differences, but what they shared in common. We learned that perhaps the Federations and Klingons could work together as allies. He is blue. His is such a meaningless existence. He eats, he eats, he eats, he breeds, and someday he dies. Let us hope that we can find more meaning in life than he has. Program complete. Enter when ready. That one was pretty fun. And once I first realized what was going on uh, with this Rise of the Tribbles, I was just laughing like crazy. Uh, I think it was a fine introduction to the Lexington Adventures. Uh, thanks again to Joey Bonese for uh, creating this. And without any other uh, explanation, I'm going to tell you about the... Um, the next episode, which is Bellum Eternus. Uh, it was recently reviewed on the uh, critics uh, show um, from uh, 
no budget productions and Philip Ferry productions called Critical but Not Cynical. And they, get, they re- gave it a really favorable review, which was gladdening to me because this was the uh, film where I made an appearance as Captain uh, Alexander McKnight uh, in the starring role. Uh, you, I apologize for what might seem like a mo- uh, single sounding, you know, blah uh, voicing from me because this was my first outing as a starring role in a fan film. And I was quite nervous. And uh, also, as you go along in some of the scenes, you'll see that my uh, legs tend to disappear if I turn around and look behind me. Well, that's because uh, this was filmed in a green screen studio. And unfortunately, with the limitations of green screen, uh, every time I turn, I guess my legs moved out of the range of the green screen and they just well as some person as one of my friends uh, described they disappeared into the green screen universe either way it was fun to make Uh, we spent a whole day at the studio uh, filming this and every single one of us filmed in front of a green screen and we did our lines one right after the other and it took a long time, but it was extremely fun. Uh, Unfortunately for me, my lines were the last one filmed and the uniform I'm in, I was wearing that all day long. It took us about 10 hours to film all of our lines, you know, with the redirections and whatnot. And so by the end of the day, that this uniform jacket I'm wearing was made of a Uh, material that tends to raise the body heat and everybody knows what happens when your body heat raises you sweat and I was a bit damp shall we say by the end of the day however that aside everything was great it was fun I made a lot of new friends and let's just have some fun and watch this oh also in this episode uh, Captain McKnight meets up with some Romulans, and and there's a bit of a surprise, possibly you might even say a family reunion, if you will. All right, without any more to say, here is uh, the second episode of the Lexington Adventures, the uh, Bellum Eternus. Uh, Enjoy.
What have you got, Savick? A starship. Extremely low power levels. Still too far to determine life signs. Hmm. Could be the Chandley. Helm, take us in carefully. Drop us to one half impulse power and proceed to one million miles from target. Captain, she appears to be adrift. Course projections show she was in a standard neutral zone patrol used by Starfleet vessels. We're at one million miles in Holden, Captain. Sir, it is confirmed. That is the Chantley. All right. Contact Admiral Hawkins at Starbase Challenger. Tell him we found the Chandley and that we're investigating. Aye, Captain. Anything else out there, Savick? Sensors are not detecting anything else. I don't like this. There's something I'm missing, but damned if I know what it is. Commander McKnight, sound general quarters and set condition read throughout the ship. Aye, Captain. General Quarters, all hands to battle stations. Condition red. This is not a drill. Captain, all decks and divisions have confirmed General Quarters and Condition red. Very well. Helm, proceed to transporter range. Engines ahead one-third. Aye, sir. Engines ahead one-third. Savick, anything new? Unlikely. The escape pods are still in place, and there are no planets within range to transport to. Entering transporter range, Captain. Full stop. Hold position. <whistles> Captain XO. Brianna, are you available for an away team? Nothing I can't get away from easily. I want you to lead a team over to the Chandley. Find out what happened to the crew, and get her ready to return to Starbase. I skip. Can you have Lieutenant Tershkova and Dr. Mathias meet me in transporter room two? A dawn's on her way. You're not going to like this, but the entire crew is dead. Don, why would anyone kill an entire crew but leave an intact ship behind? All we know is that somebody attacked the Chandley and killed her crew. And whatever did it could still be nearby. Captain, you're not going to like this, but we found a Klingon mind sifter on board. What the hell would the Chandley have one of those on board for? Unknown, Captain. Make a note to have the text look at it later. Is the Chandley ready to be taken back to Starbase? Alex, something's happening. We've got full power, and the warp core just snapped on. What the hell? All we can say is we're not doing it. Weapons coming online. She is targeting the Lexan. Skip, I think the Chanley's been hacked. Sir, I'm picking up a ship decloaking off our starboard bow. Romulan status, Lieutenant. Their shields and weapons are charged, but they've yet to target lock us, Captain. The Romulan ship is hailing us. On screen. Patches through to the Chandler, too. Fascinating. She'll look just like you. Who do I have the pleasure of speaking to? My name does not matter. 
I do know who you are, though. Admiral Alexander McKnight of the Starship Lexington. I've heard much about you. Your tall CR operatives are wrong. I'm not an admiral. Now, down to business. You're in violation of treaty. What are you doing on the Federation side of the neutral zone? I have come to claim the Chandley as a prize for the Romulan Star Empire. The Praetor would be most pleased. And what makes you think I'm going to allow you to do that? The Chandley violated Romulan territory while under a spy mission from Starfleet. We do not take such actions lightly. I'll be taking the Chandley in tow. Do not interfere. Commander, I will not allow you to hijack Federation property. This is your last warning. Stand down and retreat to your side of the neutral zone. As I expected. So be it, Captain McKnight. The Romulan ship is locked onto us. She's going to fire. Brace for impact. The Romulans are attempting to cloak. Fire phasers and take out her cloak. Direct hit to their cloaking device. She is no longer able to disappear. Sophia, give me everything you've got from the Warp Corps. Auxiliary, life support. Everything. Aye, sir. I'm giving it all I've got and more. You are a lifesaver. I'll add it to your task, Skip. Seven. Help me get this firewall up. We've got to stop the Romulans from using the Chanley as a weapon. Working on it, Commander. We should have control back. For now. Helmets responding. We have control, Commander. Good work, Savage. Unfortunately, it may only last so long. The Romulans are attempting to hack into Chandley's computer. Just keep him out, Savage. Valentina, give that Romulan ship everything you've got. I target Lexington. Target Romula. Lexington, we've got control of the Chandley. But we don't know for how long. Captain McKnight, the Romulan ship shields are down. Give them hell. My pleasure, sir. Direct hit. Her comms array is disabled. S sir, our weapons and shield systems are running low. Yeah, that did the trick. The Romulans are no longer hacking us. Oh, sh The Romulans are firing a plasma torpedo. Come on, Dad. The Lexington has sustained massive damage. God, what does she have left? Let's introduce the Romulans to the concept of hell. Fire, Valentina! Savvy? Freeze the Romulan ship. Copy the Lexington. Mm -hmm. Channel open, Commander. Romulan Commander, this is Commander Brianna Smith of USS Chandler. You are to stand down and prepare for evacuation. You are in no shape. Continue with this battle. I'll see you in the fire first! Commander, I am detecting further explosions from within the Romulan ship. Valentina, back us away.
Can you get me the Lexington? She's still on our channel. Lexington, what's your status? We made it. No thanks to that plasma we ate. We've sustained heavy damage and casualties. I'm on my way back to the Lexington. Understood. Commander, prepare the Chandley to proceed back to Challenger with the Lexington. Commander Savick, you and I have some things to discuss. Indeed we do, Captain. Good work today, everyone. McKnight out. Well, Alex, what do you make of the situation? Well, Eric, I'll tell you, we got our butts handed to us pretty good out there by the Romulans. And my crew did an excellent job of fighting the battle. However, I have a foreboding uh, feeling that something else is on the horizon, like a storm front coming and you don't know where it's coming from. And that just scares the bejesus out of me. I can tell you, I think whatever's happening goes beyond this situation. I think this goes beyond Starfleet itself. Program complete. Enter when ready. Before we go on to the next uh, episode, episode three, After Action, I'd like to show you a little bit of behind the scenes uh, from the shooting of Bellamy Turnus. We shot at Warp 66 Studios in uh, Harrison, Arkansas. And it was, you know, the studios looked like an old school and that's because it was, uh, it was an old elementary school. They have tons of Star Trek stuff there. They have sets uh, from the original series and uh, being the Star Trek nerd that I am and was and probably forever will be, I was so happy about being able to go down there and actually sit in the captain's chair and explore the bridge of the Enterprise. I, yeah, I know it wasn't really the original sets, but it was close, very, very close, and I was thrilled to be able to do that. Um, so, but anyway, without getting into it too much, here is the behind the scenes uh, slideshow from Bellum Eternus.
Program complete. Enter when ready. Uh, that was fun to see again, uh, remembering everything from the shoot of Bellamy Turnus. made a lot of friends. It was a great deal for me as a Star Trek fan to be able to do that. And, and especially uh, explore Warp 66 Studios uh, Star Trek sets from the original series. Oh, that was fun. But anyway, next up is episode three in the Lexington Adventures. Uh, this is called After Action. And this is something that happens in any military-like organization after a significant event uh, or military action, such as what occurred in Bellamy Turnus. Uh, it shows Captain uh, Alexander McKnight uh, explaining what happened to Rear Admiral Eric Menard. And it's it was fun to do. Uh, my scenes were shot in one day and it, it was great fun. It really was. And now a little bit of an Easter egg or maybe a couple on uh, after action is that the pizza rolls we were consuming were not actually cooked. So I was having to pretend to eat a cooked uh, pizza roll when it was actually frozen. And let me tell you, that took some acting. Um, and Notice very closely the picture on the coffee cup that I am drinking from. Uh, a little bit of a cross-reference there. All right, without anything else, uh, here we go. The after action episode of the Lexington Adventures. Come. Alex, how are we doing? It's good to see you. Did you have a seat? Eric, how are you doing, old friend? You know how it is being an admiral. Polishing the seat with my ass instead of being an engineering wreck and doing some real work. I hear that. At least you're away from the flagpole here. I was in Frisco. That had to hurt. <laughs> Try being the deputy Starfleet commander for a day. I was living on coffee and aspirin. Aspirin? Yeah, pain reliever. Mostly for headaches. Oh. Well, I found that these help with those type of headaches. <laughs> Who do you think introduced you to them? How's the wife and crew? Angie's doing okay. 
I left her in the recording studio to get her mind off of things, and most of the crew took the Chandley back to Earth for repairs and overhaul. You're one lucky bastard. Yeah, in more ways than one. Yeah, I was reading your report. Interesting reading, wasn't it? That's an understatement, my friend. Not only does the newest ship in the fleet get its ass kicked, but now the Romulans have a device that will allow it to fire while cloaked? Yeah, let me answer the second part of that first. It seems like the Romulans have solved that power problem. By God. The implications. And if they give it to the Klingons. Yeah, and that's what kept me awake at night after that fight. I sure hope that was the only prototype and not a full production model. What makes you think it's a prototype? Remember when Kirk ran into that bird of prey back in 67? And then six months later, I ran into its sister ship? Romulan sure loved to test their new play toys in Federation space. And mess with our heads in the process. That seems to be their M.O. Plus, they think Kennedy's still in charge of Lexington, and I'm still an Admiral. Starfleet Intelligence managed to accomplish a counter-intel mission for once? <laughs> <laughs> oh, FYI. Kennedy's getting the next Odysseus-class ship. Valkyrie. Final stages of outfitting now in Newport News. Should be ready for shakedown at the end of the year. Good. That'll make us, the Murray, and her, and the prototype Odysseus at Utopia Planitia. We need more than three of these ships, Eric. Alex. You know these three ships of the Odysseus class near the bankrupt Starfleet. So the council won't be funding anymore. Especially with the Excelsior cheaper. And they can do the same mission. No, I, I, I disagree. After this last fight, those Nova type battle cruisers are a match for the Excelsior types. <laughs> then what's your excuse for almost wrecking the Lexington? It was a two to one fight for about half of it. If it hadn't been for Savick and Brianna getting control of the channeling when they did, I wouldn't be here talking to you about it right now. I know the feeling. Drink? Well, John Wayne did say that talking is dry work. Iced coffee? does it. Thanks. Back to business. Back to business. A couple more things. One, concerning your science officer, Savick. Intelligence is going over a file with a fine tooth comb as we speak. Pending their investigation, she's on administrative leave. At restricted base. That was bull, Eric. Yanking one of my senior officers off of my staff and not informing me, her captain? Then you should know. It's not my call. Security suspended her clearance the moment the Lexington pulled in. I mean, a hostile twin sister? Where did that come from? Eric, she was as surprised as the rest of us when the Romulan commander came on screen. No way she could have faked that. She's half Vulcan. And she controls her emotions. Also, she's half Romulan, which means she's more passionate than most people think. Believe me, I saw the look of shock on her face when her twin appeared on screen. Vulcans don't do that. Okay. And what if she was play acting? If she pulled the wool over Starfleet's eyes, she did a heck of a con job on the Vulcans. And that would deserve the acting award of the decade. One of the first things that I did after the fight was to grill Savick about her twin sister. She swears 
She thought her sister was dead after the Romulans abandoned her home planet. But her sister's dead now, so that's sort of a moot point. Yet Savick's twin sister was in command of one of their best battleships. You don't get that far in Romulan politics or in the military without some influence. Or without knowing how to dirty one's hands. Let's not forget Savick has conveniently forgotten to mention her twin in any of her security interviews. Better yet, managed to keep it secret for years. You've got a point, Eric, but I know that Savick is clean. And how do you know this? Outside of my instincts? Well, I shot a message off to the Vulcan High Command asking them about their little expedition to her planet. What was their answer? I can summarize it in one word. Poet. Polite, but unmistakable. I thought about firing a message off to Ambassador Sarek, but I thought better of it. Yeah. The last thing we need right now is to piss off Sarek. Or the High Command. If they don't want to talk to us about it, then it's their choice. And intelligence has sources we don't. So let's leave it at that. But Savick's suspension stands. Pending the results of the intelligence investigation. That's bull, and you know it, Eric. It's no use yelling at me, Alex. It's out of my hands. If you didn't sign off on her suspension, who did? Vice Admiral Daniel Two Wolves. The Chief of Starfleet Intelligence. Why? Danny Two Wolves? He and I go way back to the Academy. He was to me like Finnegan was to Kirk. This is his way of getting back at me. And you can take this whole matter up with him. I'm just following orders. I know you are. But believe me, I'm going to be calling Danny about this. And that's not going to be pretty. You think getting a volunteer demotion to captain would cool your jets a little? My demotion wasn't exactly voluntary. That's the word around the fleet. Well, that's kind of true. I did shoot my mouth off during council briefing about a top secret project that has recently been in the not-so-public eye. And as a result of all the events surrounding that project, Harry Morrow was forced to retire. He managed to get me a demotion and the captaincy of the new Lexington if I promise to be a good boy and not cause any trouble. I see. So there was some truth to my demotion, but it wasn't quite as voluntary as some people might think. Jim Kirk was the one that got the involuntary demotion after he stole and scuttled the old Enterprise. I thought I got demoted for not following the chain of command. Lots of people think that because that's what the president said at the old Enterprise crew's sentencing. Jim showed me his paperwork that said otherwise. I see. Say one thing and did another. I mean, how many officers do you know that were actually demoted for not following orders? Starfleet was going to retire the Enterprise anyway and put her in a museum when Jim Kirk scuttled her. Now... Which one do you think they got more pissed off about? Huh. Instead of Enterprise, they put the old Lexington in her place. Yep, they were going to mothball her, but my second to last act as an admiral was to sign off the order to donate her to the Starfleet Museum as the centerpiece. Hmm. Sneaky. Not to most admirals' mindset. To them, it's nothing to play the backdoor channels. And then... Sit back, watch the fireworks and the fallout. Did you? Play sneaky like that? Hell no. I was one of the few that defended Jim Kirk's actions. Harry should have let him go. You know, I've been meaning to ask you something about the theft of the Enterprise. Maybe you can answer it. If I can. Scott is good. But... 
How in the hell did he manage to circumvent all of the security protocols to allow the Enterprise to escape? I used to be a chief engineer. And I know that I couldn't have done that myself. If I told you, I'd have to kill you. Let's just say they had a higher power helping them out. You mean... I said nothing. All I said was they had a higher power helping the Enterprise crew. Who or what that is, I don't know, and neither does anybody else. <sighs> you lucky sucker. Maybe. Well, I think that about does it. One last thing I wanted to talk to you about, and this is completely off the record. You have my attention. I'm really wondering if I should retain my command of the Lexington. Why's that? That last battle, I felt like I was off my game. How so? I don't know how precisely, but I felt off. I should have anticipated that Romulan's commander's intentions a lot sooner than I did. And I should have prepared for combat sooner, much sooner than I did. From your report. You did everything by the book. So what makes you think you did something wrong? It's an instinct. Something about me just wasn't right. Alex, you haven't been in the center seat for almost 15 years now. And that may be the problem. If I'm that rusty, I may be a danger to my ship and my crew. I don't see it that way, Alex. Sure. You might be a little rusty, but... Those command instincts you have don't just disappear. Maybe you need some more training in your practice. I don't think the crew will take much more practice. We drilled and we drilled, but our first time out, we ended up in a real slobber knocker with a Nova class. You couldn't have predicted to get into a big fight in your first time out in 15 years. I think you're being too hard on yourself. Maybe you're right. Give it some more time. If after three months you don't feel like you're doing any better, you can always retire. Can you imagine me with a fishing pole? Isn't that what retirees do? I suck at fishing. Even when I was a kid. Flying, I'm a lot better at. Okay. But getting back to the point. If you still feel this way after three months, you can retire. You got a point there. Lieutenant Commander Fox to Captain McKnight. Oh! What? I forgot. Go ahead. Skipper, did you forget? I did. Sorry. Forgot what? I'll be there shortly. Oh, and are you ready for your exam? I'll be ready after this refit, Skipper. Good. I'll be there shortly. McKnight out. They want to brief me on the new gadget that they have installed on the Lexington. What new gadget? The engineers are calling it a virtual simulation hall. There's a prototype here on the Challenger, and Sophie's fighting like hell to get one for the Lexington. She wants to show me how it works. Virtual simulations. What will they come up with next? Anything else, Eric? Can't think of anything. If there is, I'll let you know. Okay. Angie and I will be around just in case, but... After 20 hundred hours, don't bother. I understand. Go ahead. Get on out of here, old man. Communications. Open up a channel to Admiral Two Wolves. Starfleet Security. So 
So I see that we have a situation on the neutral zone. Let's go ahead and open communication with the Romulans, Klingons, see if Korath has anything going on. We might need his help. We'll see where we stand. I'll pull in all channels. Everything I can do to help, know that I will. <laughs> Obviously, a lot of people went into the making of these films, and I would especially like to give a shout out to Joey Benice for creating the Lexington Adventures. Uh, it was fun. Uh, I had a great time doing this, and thanks to Joey Benice, it was the, one of the best times of my life. Thank you, Joey. And Adam Mullen, your music was great. I loved it. And... Glenn Wolf, Dan Reynolds uh, for producing or directing the uh, second episode of the uh, Lexington Adventures. Um, had a great time meeting you guys. Vance Owen, of course, uh, for introducing me to Star Trek fan films in the first place and giving me the opportunity to uh, participate in the Lexington Adventures. It was like one of the greatest times of my life. And my Co-stars, the other people who starred in uh, the Lexington Adventures, uh, Yafa Lewis, uh, Steve Atwell, Crystal Willis, uh, Juliana Rhodes, uh, Jean Reed, and Tatiana Walter, Kelly Reynolds, uh, Madison Norwood, Benjamin and Mary Jane Blystone, and Pixie Nered. Thank you all. It was a great experience, and I look forward to more of the same. And as always, I'd like to thank everybody for watching and may the great bird of the galaxy bless your planet. <laughs>